Alexander, contrary to many people, also had a heart and he was touched and moved by the poem. Of course he was. And it really came home to him. And he, Aristotle worked on it with him. Uh, that's absolutely clear. Obviously had immediate identification with what I would describe the pseudo-Homeric setting of what we knew of Macedon at the time. Hello and welcome to this week's pod. And dear listeners, today I'm fortunate to speak to Robin Lane Fox, one of Britain's finest ancient historians. He's perhaps known best for his biography of Alexander the Great. And as you heard at the top there, we discuss Alexander and Homer's Iliad. Robin has written a new book, Homer and His Iliad, and he joined me to discuss Homer, the Iliad, and the answers to the questions that have puzzled historians for centuries. Who was Homer? When was he writing? and why the Iliad has such a hold over those who have read it, even today. Robin also chats about his involvement with Oliver Stone's movie Alexander, for which he was the historical consultant, so this is a real treat for me. Links are in the show notes. Please do rate and review, and if you can, do share the pod. It helps us to grow. Plenty more great history to come, including part two of the Hundred Years' War with Gordon Corrigan, the Battle of Poitiers, and I get the reverse argument on the Parthenon marbles. The film club is Munich, Spielberg's 2005 thriller on the 1972 Olympics massacre and the Mossad response. But until then, I'll hand you over to me and Robin Lane Fox talking Homer and the Iliad. Robin Lane Fox, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We're here to talk about your new book, Homer and his Iliad and I have a few of your books and one of which was the unauthorized version which was truth and fiction in the bible so and this is this is I I mean it's not a direct equivalent but it's similar in that it's looking to get to the truth behind Homer and the Iliad so you don't you do pick quite big subjects don't you definitely um but I was very widely educated from an early age I'm so grateful for that. The question of who was Homer, when was he writing, mm. and has been really puzzling ancient historians for, for for many years. Why did you think that you know you'd be able to crack the uh, crack? Ah, the- well, I must insist the term "crack" isn't quite right. There will be many more books on Homer, but I think I believe I'm rather speaking up for a silent majority. Scholars who write on this have a a, a line to push, totally understandably. And I think there have been some very paradoxical discussions putting Homer into the 7th century BC. Not, a, I think, a majority view, but very, very powerfully advanced. And I think they're wrong. And I wanted to give people a sense of what the uh, debate is about, what are the crucial items, and gave them, in the end, seven reasons why I go for a much earlier date. Will I persuade everybody? Of course not. You never do. But I do believe it's correct. And I also think as I think many scholars do, that this makes us rethink the whole um, idea of what has been known as the Dark Ages. There's a wonderful remark by the great historian philosopher, R.G. Collingwood, the Dark Ages, dark to us, but not to those who lived in them. And I'm a great believer in the Dark Ages. (laughs) So I've, I've written this for people who I hope also are specialists in the Iliad, but not primarily for them. It's for everybody who either knows about the poem, who might have read uh, Stephen Fry's really excellent combined Tales of Troy, which was a huge success last year and very well done by him. And also people who know the poem and love it. They don't have to know Greek. And I hope they find my approach, I hope, clear. It's taken me, well, I could say 60 years and that it will engage them again with the poem, which to me, without any argument, is the greatest poem in the world. That is provocative because the Odyssey exists. The title is provocative because there are people who believe that Homer never existed. I mean, heaven help us, but they do. And the idea of his Iliad is itself dynamite because there are people who particularly as to the great scholars in Harvard and America who went and did much field work on oral poetry, who think that um, the Iliad is the result of something called tradition, that he evolved over 300 years. 
Well, you'll never persuade everybody, and of course they won't be persuaded by me. But I have to say, I think this view is fundamentally wrong. And that's one of my motives in writing. There are two sides to it. Where, how, and when did Homer write? And look, we don't know the answer. That's why people are still writing books. But I give you, I hope, a good sense of a, a likely answer, and also, I hope, of the alternatives. And then secondly, importantly, I could subtitle it, why the poem makes me cry. And I had an enchanting email, can you believe it, from a lady in Bulgaria who had read the book and said that it made her cry. <laughs> I couldn't be more honored. Um, you never know, you write these things, I think it's like throwing bread on the waters in say um, the pond in St. James's Park. You never know which ducks will come and take which pieces. Well, the poem to me speaks to me. I, I took it with me to my year out when I did some archaeology, worked as an archaeologist in Central America, and I took oh, the, okay. Iliad, the Iliad with me. Now, I took a translation. I think I took the penguin. Well, I did take this. This is this is it. Yeah. Evie yeah. Ruiz. Mm. Yes. And I was going to ask you about that translation because it was the penguin classic, but he, I don't think he was a... Well, he wasn't a, 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 an ancient historian like yourself, was he? No, 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 no. Ryu was one of the founders and deserves eternal credit for the marvellous Penguin Classic series. But I'm one of, I think, quite a large number of people who finds the translation very leaden. And really, um, uh, obviously, translations are always a betrayal. But I find it really not successful. And I do urge people that if they go for a penguin, the book to get is now the one redone because Penguin recognized the problem by Martin Hammond. And if you want to read through the Iliad with a, a clear prose translation to get the, the flow of the plot and what's going on, Hammond is excellent. But it's not the Iliad, he'd be the first to say. But that is a very good starting point. That's interesting. And so when we talk about the Iliad as we know it, where does the original Greek come from? How do we get access to the, the Greek in, in order to translate it? Well, and I'm talking, you know, this it's yeah. a big question, I suppose. But Yeah, it's huge. I mean, uh, there is obviously an easy answer to how do we get access from later copied manuscripts that went on being copied and copied and copied. There's a very famous one going back to the 10th century AD, been copied by scribes for a long while. Uh, textual experts would say that apart from one or two intrusive books, the, the area that's been inserted uh, over time is probably no more than one or two percent. You really didn't have to worry too much. How we or anyone in antiquity got to a written text of Homer is, of course, the hundred and one dollar question to which I have answers, naturally. And I know there is a paradox involved. I believe a straightforward view that Homer dictated the poem. We haven't got every version he ever composed in performance, but we've got a very long one that he dictated. And I think my slight originality is to answer why he did that. There's been much discussion um, as to why anyone who had no idea of oral written text really would do it. And I think he did it for his family because Many of the crafts in early Greece, we know independently, are transmitted at first within families. This is something we can all relate to. We all want our children to be able to do something. Mine, wonderfully, uh, did digital technology, which I couldn't begin to do myself. I had a clue how to do an app. Um, and they are multimillionaires of the most enchanting kind. And I think that Homer thought by getting a, a, a text down, slaves or members of his family. Of course, I love the idea that he, only an idea, that he had a technologically competent daughter. I mean, there is one problem with Homer and his Iliad. Inevitably, the more I wrote, the more I think Homer had aspects of me, but <laughs> there's one enormous difference. I can't begin to write poetry and I'm not a genius. And I think it is, in my view, back to the original family copy that the bulk of our Iliad goes. I'm the first to know, and I hope I convey the big problem. How on earth could somebody take down in dictation without shorthand 15,000 words, in my view, as early as the mid 8th century BC? I know the problem, but I still think we just have to make the leap. It's very, very dangerous to think in modern analogies. 
But I do think those of us who unfortunately were 50 when the big internet revolution came in need to remember how it spread in some areas so fast. It's a complicated technology. You've got to do all the screen work and everything. People learned it very, very fast. And at the same time, it spread rather patchily. Well, it was very, very slow to spread to me, I have to say. You're probably absolutely brilliant at it. And of course, uh, uh, modern communication, far different to the Dark Ages. But once alphabetic writing, which it was the case, was the Greek invention, absolutely fundamental invention in the whole history of world expression, it spread patchily, but I think it spread very quickly. And people didn't have an awful lot to do. <laughs> In many days, the one were competing calls on their time. They had probably slaves who looked after them, and they had time to perfect this art and get it up very quickly. The big counter example is look, Robin, if you think there was 15,000 words written down on something in the 8th century BC, where are other examples? Well, all we've got are imperishable surfaces. We have uh, pottery, for instance. So I use an analogy which I hope is helpful. If you only had graffiti from, say, I don't know, Moscow <laughs> and Petersburg in 1860, would you ever believe that Dostoevsky dictated whole chunks of his work? He never wrote it down. A lady would come, and in the morning, Dostoevsky would just dictate it to her. In fact, he so got into it that poor woman, she ended up married to him. I'm not saying that Homer married his dictatee, but... Um, <laughs> The point is, it, it can happen. We would never guess that if we only had inscriptions on bits of pottery or wall from, from Russia, or indeed from Milton's England. Milton did the same. Yeah. So I make that leap. I'm not alone in making it. I think I would emphasize that at this stage in Homeric scholarship, it's just about impossible to be completely original. Almost every possibility, including Homer as a woman, have been aired. But the important thing is which cluster of suggestions you bring together, and that can have a slightly original spin. And there are places, I'm only guessing, but I'm guessing with evidence that makes it more probable to my mind than just conceivable. There are places where I hope my bundle of hypotheses does add up to something people haven't always seen before. That's the way I put it. And the second half, why does the poem make me cry? That goes back really early in my years, very soon, age 13. I was so struck by the poem when I first met a bit of it. But people never discussed this in academic circles. Um, I'm sure they loved it, but they were concerned with them. Um, oh, I don't know, the nature of Tusa's bow or um, questions of land tenure on linear B tablets. And I arrived in Oxford, you know, absolutely the summit of classical learning. And it was unbelievably boring. I just kept thinking, why does this poem matter to me? Why does it make you cry? I mean, it's all very interesting about Zeus's golden rope from heaven. But that isn't what this poem is about. And not until the early 1970s in English, different story in German, did um, anyone really return to the question, what is so special about Homer? And that was great work by the Balliol um, Don, who later was Boris Johnson's tutor, Jasper Griffin. And he did actually address that basic question. But I don't always agree with him. I enormously admire his work. And I think I have areas where, of course, Jasper knew everything about the poem. I think he would actually rather enjoy um, that he didn't fully cover. And I think his view was a little one-sided. So well, that's the way it's about it. Well, one thing that you do in the book, which I loved reading, was you select your sort of top 10 books, really, I guess, or, or parts. Hmm. One of which I, I always find the death of Sarpedon hugely powerful. Ah, ah, yeah. Uh, what can one say? <laughs> I mean, yes. The trouble is, I would just say two things. I do the top 10 because my brilliant digital son said to me, um, Paul, we've got to have the highlights. You must realize <laughs> people have short attention span, want to know what's the best. So I thought, all right, we'll do that at the beginning of book uh, part two. I have a brilliant scholarly colleague who refers to such things as nuanced paraphrase. <laughs> a wonderfully damning remark. But I would say trying to paraphrase adequately those books 
was the most time consuming and the most difficult thing. And it had a wonderful consequence. I must have read them so often. And I worried when I sat down to write. Will I think at the end, I loved this book when I was 16, 20, 30, 40, and no more now. I love it even more. I simply, every single time you look at it, you see yet more skill in it. So I love doing the highlights. And why do you think it's the Iliad for you? The, the Odyssey, I guess one could argue, the Odyssey is perhaps more accessible to younger readers, the wanderings of Odysseus. Yes. I mean, I, I read the Iliad first, and so that's why I've always Good. loved it more of the two. But the Odyssey, one could argue, is is more accessible. Do you think, what is it about the Iliad that differentiates it from the Odyssey? What a good question. Uh, oddly, I read the Iliad first, and for me, it's always been supreme. I hope my final chapter um, picks on something underplayed, a phrase I borrow from some golden pages by C.S. Lewis when writing about Milton. He, he describes en passant a quality of the Iliad he calls ruthless poignancy. Wow, you know, those were the days when a, a, a reader could say it in two words, based on pathos, based on irony, that awful feeling that it's, we feel the whole time it's too dreadful. We know it has to happen. There's very little suspense, except in the funerary games in the last but one book. We know how this plot is going to unfold, but the protagonists don't know, and we know, and we know through access to the gods what is going to happen. And tragic irony is so widely used as a phrase, or used to be, <laughs> uh, of the Greek world and the Greek tragedians and irony and so on. But you just need to remember that it's all secondary to Homeric irony. And the irony in the Iliad has this ruthless poignancy to it that the wonderful plot and the disguises of Odysseus where people don't recognise him. It's ironic that they don't know he's really the master of the household. That is at a different level. It's all wonderfully charming. It's the second greatest poem in the world. And it has a straight direction of a plot that goes beautifully through. Um, and of course, um, the amazing tales of Odysseus. What can we say about this? <laughs> complete. Well, <laughs> some people think it's another poem, another poet. Um, I have to say, I think genius strikes very seldom. And I think it's very hard to think we're two geniuses at once. <laughs> so I just believe it's clearly the later of the two that one person wrote them both. But the irony in the Odyssey is different. And it is an irony that really strikes home still, as I just tried a little bit to sketch to people. Well, you don't have to believe in the Olympian gods, but it's something central to the way we realize we have lived our lives. The awful moment when you realize, now I see, now I realize, or we are doing our very best at the moment, Oliver. We have no idea that all of this, let's say, is being picked up in Moscow and turned into Ukrainian and used to destroy the Ukrainian um, troop advance. We wouldn't be doing it if it was, but then we realize. And the fact that the readers have such brilliant privileged advance access by listening into the gods who are so much more varied and so amazing compared with the gods in the Odyssey is one of the distinctions. And there is another which Jasper Griffin in his wonderful book didn't dwell on, but the quantity of similes in the Iliad. And this is a question that I've often tried to get my mind around. It's become much more direct to us now because everybody's aware that you know the planet is not an infinite resource and nature is a problem and so on. Can you go back and read Homer through um, ecological lenses? No, you can't. I don't think he even had an idea of nature, but he uses what we call the natural world as a counterpoint so cleverly to the most poignant parts of the poem. And you don't get that in the Odyssey. You get wonderful descriptions of landscape, which you don't get in the Iliad, but the similes and the poignancy of the story, the irony, the gods, and the range of, of to me, characters. Well, you know, we're talking about the two greatest things that man has ever managed to 
in my view, dictate. <laughs> so it's a pretty close run, but it's definitely the Iliad. And I was thinking as I was reading your book, how future generations would view the Iliad and oh. whether will we see never ending translations going uh, on in the next yeah. sort of hundred or so years? Because yeah. we've seen yeah. a recent translation of the Odyssey. I think Emily Wells translated yeah. it recently um, yeah. Yeah. that was, uh, that got a lot of good reviews. Is this mm. something that will always be evolving as we, as we ourselves, our, our view of the past changes? I'm sure because I like you and your last very well put sentence. I believe that as the world changes around us, so the questions we put to, let's say, the evidence or the poem from antiquity change too. So there are always new emphases. There is a danger, which I think I highlight, I've probably been guilty of, you always are, you can't see till years later, that um, you may have been what I call one-eyed, or you come to the poem with a modern ax to grind. There have been, um, for instance, a, a string of novels and studies by women writers who have made a big thing about the way that the girls are either silenced or maltreated or abused. We all know that. They're not actually fully silenced. But that's coming to Homer with a, an agenda. Homer is not one-eyed. So obviously people will keep coming to Homer. For, I think that probably one will be the vegetarian reading. I'm not joking. I'm sure in 50 years, vegans will look back on literature and be absolutely appalled by the description of cutting up sheep, cutting up whatever. This will all be brought out more than it is now, but that's not the totality of them. If you try to approach him with an ax to grind, you'll usually cut off your own foot. And have you ever considered translating the Iliad yourself? And Oh, no, 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 no. I haven't. No, I, mean, I must also say, well, I would say that as a teacher, I have repeated the superb example given to us how lucky we were in the sixth form at Eton College. Uh, Eton is an, an exceptional in education if you're intelligent. It's not just for Jacob Rees Mogg and these artists. Well, you're speaking to a Herovian, so I'm afraid I can't agree with you. No, well, I mean, it's very odd I'm speaking to at all. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we would have, by the great Richard Martineau, um, successor to the great C.M. Wells, we would bring the Greek text and Richard would translate absolutely off the cuff to us as we followed in Greek. And I was so struck by this that I have done it in turn for people I've taught the poem, and it's really struck home to them. Keep moving fast. But when you stop and you start to think, what does that little word per mean now? Well, you can, <laughs> you can be delayed for, for a very long time, but you must keep the momentum going forwards. So simultaneous translation is something I have done into prose. But no, I'm, I'm not a poet uh, of that nature at all. I admire Peter Green's recent translation, and I will look forward to Emily Wilson's a bit. I don't know whether I'll read it. I've, I've so much money was spent on me when I was young, and I worked so hard. And the result is I don't have to use these translations. But I must put in a really good word for Alexander Pope. I love Pope. God, it was unfashionable in the mid-1960s. People thought I was mad. Now he's come right back into fashion. But Pope's notes can also sometimes be so penetrating. Quite a bit that was later brilliantly set out by Jasper Griffin is actually there in appendices or latent. I'm sure Jasper would have known it, but he didn't obviously take it from it. There's two great responses coinciding. So I like Pope and I actually rather enjoy, enjoy Lattimore, Richmond Lattimore. But what have I done? I've looked at them for five minutes. And I'll, I'll have a look, I'm sure, at Emily's. I just hope that she doesn't overplay the feminist card. It's sometimes tempting for people just to put a little too much stress. And I really hope she doesn't do what can happen. And I look at our Royal Shakespeare Company in absolute horror here, actually insert things to bring out a point you want to make. I mean, I think it's appalling that at Stratford you go to see a Shakespeare play and the RSC has written part of it. That just shouldn't be allowed. And that there should be an act of parliament protecting Shakespeare. So there, there will go on being translations, of course. And I think actually quite seriously, the vegetarian option <laughs> will certainly come forwards. That will matter a lot to people. Um, who knows? Clothing may become very important, uh, the, the weaving and the textiles. Our interests keep changing. And that is why your podcast goes on, why as historians, the subject is alive. 
it keeps changing around us, throwing up new questions, of course. But it isn't only about the presentist questions that interest us. You know, migration, obviously, is a big topic now. It's always been important. But it isn't that the Odyssey is suddenly important because it's a poem about migration. It isn't really. It's a poem about coming home, knowing where you're going. I wanted to uh, mention Alexander, Alexander the Great, who, well, he he took a copy of the Iliad. He didn't take a copy of the Odyssey with him. No, 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 no. no. Why uh, do you think Alexander adored the Iliad so much? We're talking about two imponderables. I assume, of course, he adored it for the reasons that I did, being a, a, an amazing fellow. Uh, he <laughs> loved the stories of battle, heroism, combat, I'm sure. But I also think that Alexander, contrary to many people, also had a heart and he was touched and moved by the poem. Of course he was. And it really came home to him. And he, Aristotle worked on it with him. Uh, that's absolutely clear. I would just say, I'm, I, when I wrote my, uh, still in print, 50 years later, Life of Alexander. It was my secondary source at university. So my uh, oh, classics God. department at Warwick were obviously very impressed by it. Well, it's very kind of them. They were probably horrified too. But there it is. It's still alive. It's got a, a madness in it. I'll revive it one day. But I was obviously had immediate identification with what I would describe the pseudo-Homeric setting of what we knew of Macedon at the time. And actually, obviously, people say, oh, Robin, you're too romantic. Not in that sense, I'm not. People can have role models and idealization, identification with past poems and literature very strong in them. Um, you can follow this in, uh, in Spanish history. But we then found the royal palace and tombs in Macedon. And it was very striking that there were cremation burials dating from the time of King Philip, Alexander's father onwards which really must have been in some way related or modelled to the Homeric pattern. So it's not just fantasy. There is a Homeric dimension. Of course, it's a fantasy world. I know all the uh, underpinning. It's not crazy. And Alexander lived out a life on grand heroic terms. Obviously, people like now to turn him into some sort of drunken um, lout who's on the rampage across the north of England at night, killing everybody in sight. And of course, had he been a woman, it would have been very, very different. He'd probably be even more ghastly to them. And Alexander did some terrible things. We know that. But they were errors of youth and it doesn't make them any less errors. Don't worry. But he had a, obviously an irresistible range, genius, skill, brilliance. I, we've had enough of Alexander Little. Um, I'm pleased to say my book's outlasted it. Yes, yes. Well, the, this podcast is a huge admirer of Alexander. So oh, good. Yeah. I won't hear anything against him. Yeah, well, there is the question of Titus, but I think he thought there might have been a conspiracy. He was drunk and so on. No, no, I know. And obviously people got killed and terrible things happened. They happened in wars. I uh, hate to use the phrase, stuff happens. Um, that's about the only truth of the rightful invasion. Well, there, was, well, there wasn't much political correctness back, back in the uh, fourth century BC, was there? No, there really wasn't. I mean, I think one of the very best is that they were told that there was a substance that would burn if you lit it. And there was a singing boy who sang beautifully, who was incredibly ugly. And they'd all teased him, I think, saying, you've never set fire to anything. So he said, well, all right, put it all over me and then you'll see that I can burn. Uh, and I'll, I'll then be um, set aflame, set at start a fire. So the silly fools doused this person in what actually we know was petrol, put a match to it, and of course the boy started burning and they couldn't put it out. You know, that's undergraduate pranks gone wrong, um, or banter gone wrong. Political correctness, you know, you really, um, uh, I, I really don't think so. <laughs> no. That doesn't mean it isn't a factor when we read. I would stress this. I always have come to think of historians as like the god Janus, having two heads. One, we have the advantage of hindsight. We have the presence of many changed ethical and moral views, sometimes much better, of course. And we must implicitly keep that in our readers' minds. But explicitly, if those views were never held or expressed at the time, you cannot just shower um, a, a constant battering moral disapproval and imply that the actors were all failed people. They didn't know about it. You know, I'll come back to my point. 
I don't know about you, but we're going to be looked back on as the carnivorous age. And we'll all be absolutely damned for having animals kept in pens to be eaten and all the rest of it. And until recently, there was hardly a, a vegetarian voice. And there were a few, and they were all regarded as crazy. So you do have to do justice to the, what was present in the past, but also keep in play your changed moral sensitivities. That's a very delicate balance. And if you get people who simply ascribe to actors in the past moral views they never held or, or attack them the whole time for moral views they never held, that's not good history writing. They failed in their job. I really emphasize that. And it's wonderful to hear that because I completely agree with you. It's a very sad state of affairs, I think, in, in history today at the moment. Just before I let you get back to the cricket, I wanted to ask you, we're approaching, I think, next year, 20 years since the film Alexander came wow. out, directed by Oliver Stone. And yeah. of course, you, you were the historical advisor. And there is a, a quote from Oliver Stone's book at the beginning of Homer and his Iliad. <laughs> and I wanted to ask your reflections on the film 20 years on, because I, I loved it when it first came out. I saw it twice in the cinema. Um, mm. oh. Scenes like Galgamela and things like that were, were bringing oh. the past alive. I wondered, oh, but with your sort of cold uh, heart insight into history, looking back at it 20 years on, do you still think the film, what do you, what do you think of the film from a historical standpoint? Ah, right. Well, the, the first important point is this. The, the version to get against all expectations is the one called The Ultimate Cut, which was done in 2012 on Blu-ray and is available in America. It has been, in Warner's backlist, a massive bestseller. It's three hours and 50 minutes, and I thought, oh, God, this will never work. Amazingly, that is the film, and the battle in Gorgamila comes very early, and it is quite extraordinary. Look, it's a film. I learned so much from being part of a film uh, procedure. And I also know uh, from close association with uh, Oliver, who is outstanding, of course, at the top of his tree, extraordinarily sharp and clever, that I, he, I would tell him what we do and don't know about whatever it was was being filmed. And then uh, he would always take it on board. But he had to make a film. It had to have a plot. Well, history doesn't really have a plot. And I learned something very simple, that it's incredibly expensive to have a new location. So, of course, we all would have loved to have gone to the Seawar Oasis or to have gone to Persepolis. But, I mean, the budget was absolutely impossible. And the time, you're trying to do it so, so, so compressed. And the dialogue. Well, what can you do? We, we, we really probably only know third hand what Alexander might have said on about three occasions. So it's very difficult to write dialogue. And I think the best thing I can say is we had a screening um, last December in association with the British Library Project of the ultimate cut in Regent Street Cinema. And suddenly it all came back. There we were, and Oliver came, wonderful. We had a question and answer before. He was a bit shy to get started. And then fantastic, describing it all and saying that this was the version he felt he finally got right. So I thought, I don't know what people are going to make of it. Well, we got to the, the interlude because it has an intermission and only two people got up to go. And I thought, oh dear, and I ran off. And I said, I'm so sorry you're not enjoying this. He said, no, we're loving it, but we can't get our train back to Virginia Water unless we leave now. Everybody else sat there. And it's like being taken into another universe and sort of dragged through the thorn bushes and coshed over the head. And eventually, as we got to the end, people were crying. We'd never seen this. There was a huge emotion in the audience. And one Greek friend who'd come went up to Oliver in tears and said, it's your Parthenon, a standing ovation. Well, obviously they were a select audience, but that was a lot of people. And it was away from all the critics, all the trouble. And look, we all know there are down points in the film where it doesn't quite work. But try the battles, try the partying. And I have to say, imagine, as I was, that you're on a horse charging a war elephant with armoured tusk extensions. That doesn't happen often in life. No. So it's worn very well. And obviously there are patches that never quite work. Perhaps some of the scenes in Babylon would be an example. But I think the audience there uh, really were stunned by it. 
there was so much noise surrounding it and Oliver had to cut it very, very quickly. It didn't really fully work as a shortened version, but the critics were absolutely going to kill it, whatever he did in America because of the interviews with Castro and his criticism of Republican foreign policy. It didn't matter what he did, really, but it's come through. Yeah. It's made a huge amount of money, I think, as well. Well, people like to say, oh, well, it lost $150 million. Absolute nonsense. It didn't anything of the sort. It's his biggest grossing film. But the important point about that, I, you never know the money, yeah. is that the ultimate cut, the really long version, I really mean it's not only is it so beautifully recut and refilmed, that has established itself as a major seller. Of course, I know why. Everyone wants to see me. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, you make an appearance on horseback, don't you? Oh, God, yes. I'm a, a, a crucial breakthrough in Gorgamila. There I am, for God's sake. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Reason. Blood going at full full speed. Wonderful yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yes, because beforehand, I think you weren't too impressed with Macedonian uh, uh, as horsemen, but I think you had an appreciation. Of... Oh, no, no, I always was impressed by them. My God, having carried the long Sarissa lance, no stirrups, NB, on a flat out charge on my wonderful chestnut horse called, can you believe it, Gladiator. <laughs> they couldn't catch me. I, I mean, I, I understood Homeric battle because I understood bloodlust. I was gripped by Lissa, by frenzy. If you got in the way of me, I'd just run you straight through with my rubber spear. But it was very interesting. And the whole of the King's Royal Moroccan Cavalry were trying to catch me. That doesn't happen in life. <laughs> No, but what an experience. Like Polybius, I believe historians should try to have as much experience of what they write about. Uh, I can't fight in a war. I, I, I'd be hopeless. I'd be behind the lines decoding. But it does help. Vital to go and see the terrain. Absolutely crucial thing. Crucial to try to have some idea of um, aspects that were central to Alexander's life. Look, I've never hunted a lion face to face, but I have hunted a lot. And I know um, the challenge that poses. So you get you're a little bit nearer it. And of course, you've got to be accurate and you've got to have a strong moral sensitivity. And there are brilliant historians who never get out of their desks. But I still think that on a hot 3.30 p.m. in the lower reading room of the Bodleian Library, where the great scholars are there all reading their text carefully, I do look at the clock and I smile and I think, you're all brilliant. But you've no idea what it's like to charge an elephant head on on horseback. <laughs> and I laugh. That's a wonderful way to uh, end the chat. Robin, thank you so much for your time. It's brilliant. No, thank you. There we go. Thank you very much for listening. If you haven't read the Iliad, I hope this inspires you to do so. And if you have, Robin's book is enormously enjoyable to read. As I said, there's plenty more great history to come on the pod. But in the meantime, thank you and good night. <laughs>